Okay, I'll get started. Thanks ever so much for coming along. Um, I'll explain. My name's Ben Tullis. I am uh, here really as a sysadmin, you know, representing 12 years of being a uh, professional Linux sysadmin, and I'd like to talk to you about defensive information warfare on open platforms. So it's um, about security and how to go one step beyond sort of server hardening. So when you're, when you're building a platform, uh, trying to uh, make sure that on that platform you know as much as possible about the potential threats, any attacks that are going on, how to uh, try to mitigate and respond to those. So here's my background here. Um, I've worked in various places over the sort of 12 years as a, a sysadmin um, in managed service provision and government research and various other places, never in multinationals, never in large corporate environments, never in heavily regulated industries. So a lot of my experience really comes from the SME space and um, also in the outsourced sort of enterprise sector. So I've had a lot of exposure to um, information security practice, both good and bad. Um, so I've come across some you know, dreadful systems and um, I've dealt with really my fair share of systems that have been compromised. And if I'm honest, also systems that are yet to be compromised. So um, some of the systems I've helped to build and tried to make secure and try to you know, teach the people who actually manage them to look after them. Uh, some of the systems I have managed have been built by other people and are less secure and uh, less visible. So uh, that's what we've got. Now, I'll, I'll explain. I've ended up with far too many slides. And um, so I'm going to sort of rattle through them. I'm not going to try and read off everything that's on the slides. They're all out there. They're all up there. Um, so certainly in the initial part, I'm going to try and rattle through some of the slides. Because I would hope, really, that in a Linux sort of conference, a lot of the people here should have a good basic understanding about information security and a good grasp of how to uh, build a secure system anyway. So I apologize, it really, if, if sort of some of what I say might seem sort of basic or might seem to people a bit like, well, you know, air is good for breathing, food is good for eating. I, I don't really mean it to be that way. I, I want to come on to the tools and techniques which are uh, there for system administrators and any information architect to use to uh, develop more secure systems. Uh, so I'll rattle through certainly the initial part of the presentation uh, because I think the interesting parts are at the end um, and uh, I'd like to get that far. So here's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be just uh, defining uh, information warfare and defensive information warfare. We look at what the threats are, uh, what the targets are, and then you know, just briefly talk about the basics that uh, you know, we, we hope we're all doing. Uh, then the main topics are increasing network visibility. So how do we go about making sure that we can see all of the network traffic or make sure that um, we can see the maximum amount of network traffic and, and get the most from that visibility? How to increase the host visibility? So you know, to make sure that we know as far as we can what's going on on, on our hosts, on our um, Linux systems or other systems. And, and also that includes network devices, uh, switches, routers, firewalls, etc. Um, moving on, we've got log management tools and techniques. So really, again, from the basics of you know what do we do with syslogs, what do we do with application logs, to bringing them all together and extracting from that sort of log source and log sync the relevant information security information, how to present that. Uh, and then lastly, some focus distributions that uh, if you're interested in network security monitoring or host security, you may want to look at these distributions as um, they contain a lot of the tools that we'll be talking about. So a brief definition, what's information warfare? It's, it's just a model. Um, and it is helpful because it allows us to abstract away from the fine details about who's doing what or you know, what software or packages we need, to, we need to do. It's a model comprised of four key elements. And the first is the information resource. Now, that could be you know, pictures of your kids, or it could be your um, company's uh, company credit card information, any, anything at all. You just think about the information resource, and it has some intrinsic value to someone. Either you know, they can sell it, or they can use it for something else. Moving on, we've got the players of the game. So it is you know, a model that has a game. We have the offensive team and the defensive team. And in this context, we are the defensive team. We're building 
uh, an information system, the other team is going to try to attack it. They're going to try and launch an attack on our information resource. And the offensive team really can include anyone. This is, this is why it's so sort of interesting, because it can include insiders within your organization, um, hackers, criminals, corporations, governments, and terrorists. So the, the gamut of um, players on the opposing team. And um, the third element is the offensive operation. So this is you know, your, your offensive team launching an attack. And the, the aims here are to increase the value of the information resource to them and to decrease the value to the defensive team. We've got the three classes of attack, and that is increased availability for the offensive team, decreased integrity, and decreased availability of information for the uh, defensive team. And we've given, I've given there some sort of examples of the type of uh, attack that can take place. So finally, the last uh, element in our in defensive you know, information warfare model is the defensive operation. So we've got the information resource, the players of the game, what they do, and what we do. So they're designed to protect the information resources, and they must cost less than the losses that would occur if we were not carrying out these operations. And we've got six classes of defensive operations. So all of the tools and techniques that we're going to be talking about today fit somewhere into these classes of prevention, deterrence, indicators and warnings, detection, emergency preparedness, and response. That, those are um, the classes of defensive operation that we're talking about. OK, so um, to classify the sort of threats, we're just basically going to be talking about random threats and targeted threats. There are many, many ways of actually doing the classification, but we're just really keeping it simple here. We've got random threats, and that would include malware distribution, you know, so people can download infected files, uh, or you know, the, the ubiquitous USB sticks. You know, people will, anyone can pick them up, put them in the computer, and information warfare is on the cards. Uh, we've also got IP address scanning techniques, so anyone who's just put a server on the internet, uh, uh, a honeypot or anything else, will know that very quickly, if you leave an SSH port open to the world, people will find it, people will try and authenticate it against it. And th that is the kind of IP address scanning. Um, I met, make mention here the Kana botnet, which was actually also briefly um, highlighted in Mika's uh, presentation uh, recent, um, just prior to this. That is a very interesting um, topic there, and it's worth uh, a look at, really, because it was a, a botnet that was created with 420,000 hosts, created just using default passwords on hosts. Um, and it was, I think, 2012 it was created. Uh, most of the hosts were routers, but they were you know, admin, admin, admin password, um, default uh, um, accounts on network hardware and, and various other bits of hardware. And it was used to create one of the most detailed maps of the internet so far. So it was used in a non-nefarious um, uh, application. And in fact, the, the botnet was deleted at the end of its useful life with a little note uh, saying what it was, how it was created, what it was used for, and how you might want to secure these kind of hosts in the, in the future. So that's a, an aside, really, but well worth reading up about. And some of the random threats, uh, war driving and session hijacking. Um, you know, so anyone can be affected by these kind of targets. With focus threats, uh, you know, we hope that we're not targeted by these, but if someone's got a grudge against anyone in particular and they really want your information resource, they want to get into your network, they want your password, whatever it is, there are many resources available to, to them. And the, the techniques are traditional sort of network penetration, so just try and guessing passwords. Um, or if you can capture some information, if it's encrypted information, you can then take that offline, use whatever resources you want to, to do to try to do reverse you know, crypto analysis on that uh, thing. And you know, Cloudcracker is a good example of that now. So I hope that you know, nobody out there is, is uh, relying on a PPPT P, VPN, for instance, because really these days that kind of thing is not secure. If you capture the traffic, upload it to Cloudcracker, you know, pay a few dollars and it'll be cracked with cloud resources, um, various other things. We've got also known exploits, so you know, vulnerabilities, uh, privilege escalation, if you've got a, a trusted member of staff who has some access, um, 
can that member of staff elevate their privileges and gain access they shouldn't have? Social engineering, you know, can you just lend me your password? Oh, oh can I, you know, all of these kinds of things can be used to um, enable information warfare uh, in a, a focused manner. And we, we only really need to look at the um, things that have been coming out of the Black Hat conferences and DEF CON and various other things to know that actually the offensive team doesn't even need to be well resourced these, day, these days. We've got some pictures here of a, you know, a Pony Express and a Mini Pona. So you can now, you know, for less than 40 quid, you can build yourself a Dropbox like this, power it from anything, a battery, catch WPA traffic, capture any old network traffic. If you can plug it into the physical network, hoover it up, enough information, take it offline and decrypt it. So the, it's frightening to think that if we are, attack, if we are the focus of an information warfare attack, um, it's really quite frightening to think that it's easy uh, for anyone to, to do. So just briefly looking at the targets, don't try and sort of read this, but it's, it's just three relevant news articles from sort of July here. We've got um, you know, two from the home. One is uh, how someone on the internet hacked into a baby monitor and was able to speak to a, a child through the internet uh, somewhere else in the world. Another, the one on the right is you know, the smart TVs where you now wave at your TV. They are you know, Linux-based hosts sitting on the network and they can be you know, the target of information warfare. You wouldn't like to think that people can just turn on the camera on your TV or laptop and see what you're doing, but uh, it's there. And the, the center one is um, a news article that came out from GCHQ uh, just saying about how prevalent information warfare is at the, at the sort of nation scale and, and I suppose um, in industry. Um, so there's an awful lot of information out there about the scale of it. So moving on, uh, just the basics of information, defensive information warfare. Um, I'm not going to go through all these. I'm not going to sit here and tell you how to make good passwords or how to make them remember. You, you haven't come for that. Um, I'm you know, not going to tell you about how to lock doors and physical security, but it doesn't go without saying, and, you know, if you don't have good documentation about your systems, if your team can't communicate, you need to do something about the communication and the, the team. If you're not backing it up, you know, all bets are off. So um, it needs to be said, but I'm not going to harp on about it. Uh, and similarly, any, anyone out there developing... Um, an information system, building an information system, really needs to have a, a monitoring system in place. I'm not going to try and sell you one. Um, oh, oh, I see. Sorry about that. Any monitoring system, you know, these are the, the, the basics. Record all the metrics. Monitor everything you can. Keep all of those because they're all useful in analysis and response. And some people just say, oh, well, you know, we've got a monitoring system. We use Nugget. We've got a bank of green lights. It's not really what it's about. You need to review that, keep it current, um, update the configuration based on any kind of um, changes or incidents, security incidents, anything like that. And use multiple systems, use parallel systems where people just say, well, I like green lights and I want to know where everything's working. But they're not using a network security monitoring system. They're not using a performance uh, monitoring system. So you really need to get the, all of that information and then you can present it. Um, so the first thing we're going to be doing is increasing network visibility. That's, that's the first of the, the core parts of uh, what we're talking about with defensive information warfare. So it's about finding needles in haystacks. You know, there's so much information, there's so much data passing. Um, an information warfare attack might be tiny, might be a few bytes, might be, you know, one um, transaction with one web server, and it can be buried in log files, it can be buried in network traffic. So we're going to be taking the network traffic and scanning it for known patterns, you know, known attack patterns, rule-based matches. Um, we're going to take a sidestep and look at wireless uh, intrusion detection systems as well, um, because you know, many, many things these days are built on uh, Wi-Fi, and we need to know how to make sure, as far as possible, that we can build secure wireless systems as well. Um, we look at profiling the network traffic. So, yeah, we, we might know that, you know, on this network segment, it's a storage network. So I'm only expecting to see iSCSI traffic on this network. That's great. If you only see iSCSI traffic on that network, things are good. If you see anything else on that network, that literally should be ringing alarm bells. 
So this is sort of how to go about from profiling network traffic, filtering out the legitimate traffic, and seeing what else is wrong, what, what, what is not there, and implementing anomaly detection. So uh, if you've got a, a network you know, which is supposed to be fixed, uh, the number of hosts are not changing, the IP addresses are not changing, if IP addresses change, you need to know about it. So that's network anomaly detection. So again, this is kind of the, the basics for capturing Ethernet traffic. One of the most core tools is using m switch mirror ports also known as span ports, monitor ports, different hardware. I'm sure many of you will have used this kind of thing, um, but, so I'm just going to step through, basically. One port receives traffic that's sent over one or more of the other ports. So here's a sort of um, a, a diagram of how it would be configured in a managed or smart switch, and you're sending traffic to port one that is also going over two, three, and four. Okay, and... In terms of the network infrastructure, this is how it looks. You have a protective monitoring server, which in our case is running Linux. Um, that passively receives all of the traffic sent over the other ports. That's about achieving network visibility. It doesn't send anything over there. It just receives that information. Uh, when you're building a redundant system, you would simply sort of double up the switches and the monitoring ports. So you've got two capture interfaces because you've got two switches and um, redundant routes to the internet. So um, when you're dealing with larger infrastructure, so sort of tree-based and, and sort of switches that cascade down in different levels, you've got various different options. The first option here is the sort of higher end, uh, so it's really only available in high-end switches, Cisco's, HP's, Alcatel's, and that kind of thing. It's actually not where most of my experience is, because I, as I say, I've worked in the SME sector, and um, I've worked with low to mid-end equipment, I have tended to use the option two of distributed monitoring. So you've got one central monitoring server, and then in each of your locations, these might be branch offices, or they might be you know, separate buildings within a campus, or whatever else. You have remote monitoring servers. They will scan the traffic and act on the traffic that they can see, and they'll report back to a central monitoring server all of the events, all of the alerts, um, statistical network traffic information, and the system log files. Okay, all right, so far? Great, so um, one of the first tools that we're gonna be talking about is Snort, and, and this I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, I just wanna talk about it briefly because this is one of the key network intrusion detection system tools um, that is there. We've been talking about using it in passive mode where a protective monitoring server listens and can see all of the network traffic on all these switch segments. It also does offer an inline mode, um, which we'll come back to a little bit later, and that can do intrusion prevention. So if it sees malicious or nefarious traffic, it will block it or reject it. And uh, it searches the network traffic based on rules, so rules matches. And we've got here, I've, I've listed how the various rules are updated, source fire, who are the original authors, I think, or maintainers of Snort, they sell a rule set to commercial subscribers, uh, which is updated daily. That rule set is made available to registered users free um, 30 days later. And there's also a community rule set and third-party rule sets. So which rules you choose to use and, and where you get them from, that's up to you. But uh, first of all, building the intrusion detection system and making sure that traffic is visible is a key step. Um, so here, just some, some key pointers, really. We need to make sure that the network interfaces that are capturing the traffic uh, don't do um, uh, packet reassembly or, or so offloading. So w there are some uh, conflicts here for generic receive offload and uh, large receive offload. That helps um, to turn off some of the features on the network interface card, which can end up with spurious results when you're doing uh, packet sniffing and, and, and network capture. So um, you be updating the rules with Oink Master or Pulled Pork or you know, just manually if, if need be, if that's appropriate. And um, we have here sort of the, the snort can be configured. It is often or has been considered difficult to configure snort and get it right and get the alerts to be correct, get the performance to be correct, um, get the actions that result from pattern matches to be correct. So... Um, there are many ways of doing this, and there will be lots of different ways in your environments. You, we, you might want 
you know, syslog alerts that get incorporated later. We might want to output to unified two files, which are, if you're in a high performance or large capacity network, um, that is kind of recommended these days that you output to unified two format and use another tool, technically, uh, typically Barnyard 2, to take that output and then act on it, forwarding it to whatever other systems you have in place. So, um, it's also worth mentioning Suricata. Uh, this is another network intrusion detection system, uh, started in 2009, um, multi-threaded by default, so it was intended to um, tackle some of the uh, threading problems and performance problems that Snort has been uh, bugged with. Um, you can use it at the same time, it can use the same Snort rules, um, choose whatever you, whatever you wish really. Uh, Another one that's uh, worthy of mention is Bro. Um, Bro is a very interesting platform. It's a passive network analysis platform. So it wants to see all of that traffic, and it's got a full scripting engine to say what should happen, um, what can happen, what you want to happen, based on what traffic it sees. So you can make it into a network intrusion detection system. You can make it into an intrusion prevention system. But you kind of have to script it or use scripts that other people have, have created. Um, one that I mentioned at the end there, which I found out about recently, which is quite good, it, in network traffic, it can see files. So if you've got HTTP traffic, for instance, it will see those files, uh, isolate them, MD5 hash them, and it can then compare those MD5 hashes against online malware databases run by Team Cymru and others. So that's you know, one example of how a network analysis platform can be scripted to behave in certain ways. Okay, um, so we're going to take a sidestep briefly to wireless intrusion detection systems and one of the key tools that, uh, that's in use. Now, best practice really at the moment in Wi-Fi is to implement WPA2 Enterprise. It's the most difficult to um, decrypt because if you have the four-way handshake, you end up with a, um, a file that you can send off to an offline analysis, cryptanalysis, and, and break WPA2 PSK without too much difficulty, depending on what the uh, passphrases are and so on. But WPA2 Enterprise is still difficult to crack. Um, it can be, you can create that kind of system with host APD, WPA supplicant, and the right SSL certificates and so on. But um, the other key thing is 802.11w, all of the wireless network traffic management frames are themselves protected. So if you don't have that best practice system at the moment, it is vulnerable to attack, it's already vulnerable to attack, and we're going to consider briefly two kinds of attack and how we might detect and respond to the attack. Okay, and that is a rogue access point, so an access point that pretends to be um, a, a legitimate access point for a company. Um, you, you turn on your pad, your phone, your whatever it is, and it connects to the rogue access point instead of a legitimate one, and that can then be used for man-in-the-middle attacks. And a de-authentication attack, uh, now, that can be used to capture a four-way handshake, or it can be used to cause a uh, denial-of-service attack. So, uh, briefly, we're going to be looking at Kismet and how, how one can use Kismet, uh, the tool, to detect this kind of attack. Um, here's some information about it. I haven't got time to read it all out. I'm sure you can sort of take it in. Um, some of you may have used Kismet before. It's also useful for wireless network reconnaissance and capture. Um, so, here's a diagram of that, our first example, which is detecting a rogue access point. We've got legitimate wireless access clients, we've got a physical network with two legitimate access points and two Kismet drones. Uh, so these are capturing network traffic, um, or sniffing for, for, for wireless network traffic, and we've got a rogue access point there. So in this case, um, Kismet server is connected to the Kismet drones and, rec and receives the information from Kismet drones. Here's the configuration element which allows us to define the legitimate access points for our network. So here's the Kismet configuration file. The alert that we're interested in is the AP spoof and it gives some information there on about the, the thresholds and the, the, the time limits of sending these alerts. Um, there's our AP name, Tullix. And here is a list of two MAC addresses for the valid access points. If the Kismet drones see any other access point which is broadcasting that SSID, we know that we've got a rogue access point, generate an alert. Okay? 
Uh, the second type of wireless network attack uh, is a deauthentication attack here. So we've taken hypothetically some Wi-Fi cameras that are operating over WPA2 or something like that, but don't have the protected management frames. Um, an offensive player can cause a deauthentication attack. So they can continually send deauthentication packets, essentially knocking those cameras offline. Again, the same uh, network configuration there. The Kismet drones report back to the Kismet server. We are seeing a deauthentication flood or broadcast disconnection packet. If, if a disconnection packet is sent to a broadcast address, that'll technically take down all of the wireless um, access, wireless clients for um, that access point. We need to know about it. So we can't, in this case, prevent the systems being taken down, but we can detect and respond to the alert. We generate an alert which goes into our security information and event management system. Come back to. So that's it. We've done a, a brief overview on network intrusion detection systems and scanning network traffic. We've looked at wireless intrusion detection systems. Moving on to network traffic profiling. I'm just going to highlight a couple of tools. These are not the only tools. They may not be suitable for every environment, but NTOP and NTOP Next Generation NG. Um, these are very useful because they give you a rich graphical interface um, describing and allowing you to drill down into the type of network traffic that you can see, the volume of network traffic, um, who's talking to whom on the network. So you can see this information. And again, you go to a technique there, PF ring, for um, increasing the number of threads and cores that can be used for this kind of capture and analysis. Um, so here, is, I mean, again, don't try to look at the details of this, but it's just an example of this is the rich graphical interface on NTOP Next Generation. It's just a, a few minutes of capture on my own home network. Um, and it shows you application protocols, who's talking to whom, top hosts, top application protocols, various other things. You can drill down into that. And if you've incorporated NetFlow information, you can see many sites and more sites than you can see um, from one host generally. Here's the older version, NTOP, uh, still a very useful interface and a great deal of information um, about all the hosts. You can, you can really, really drill down into um, what that is and keep that information persistently um, for whatever period you define. Okay, going to move on briefly to NetFlow. Um, it is um, uh, very useful, but especially in the SME space and in, in um, smaller companies and, and people without dedicated network resources, I've seldom seen it used or used um, effectively. So I just want to have a brief uh, overview. It itself is a network protocol and a, a, um, a format for describing network traffic. So if you've got vast quantities of network traffic, unless you've got a data center um, that's intended for storing that traffic, all we really want to keep is the statistical information or you know that, that's what we, we can keep. Um, so NetFlow, in this case, um, exports, emits UDP packets which describe the rest of the network traffic uh, from one or more exporters, and they're sent to one or more NetFlow collectors, and then they're stored for long-term analysis. OK, so from the exporter side, so when we want to create NetFlow streams, it's already built into high-end routers. So there's a lot of Cisco houses out there. They already have um, NetFlow-capable switches, which will just emit UDP packets describing the rest of the traffic. Uh, Juniper and various other switch manufacturers and, and uh, hardware manufacturers will support it in hardware. But that's not necessary. So if you've got you know, your D-Link switches or your Netgear or whatever other kinds of network switches and you are using mirror ports in this way, you can then use open source exporters to look at that traffic and then describe it and send that statistical information off to a collector. So we've got some here, nProbe, fProbe, softflow D and rflow. They're all useful tools, uh, and they can all do this um, in various different ways. It's also built into OpenV switch if you're um, using a virtual switch infrastructure and you, or you've got sort of cloud projects underway. OpenV switch has got it. Other um, Virtualization providers and cloud providers will also have their own implementation. Okay, so that's the exporter side. On the collector side, I already mentioned that NTOP and NTOP NG can be used as NetFlow collectors and can incorporate that statistical information into NTOP. There's another one which I am um, 
familiar with, which I use and I have a great deal of respect for, which is NFDump and NFSEN. So this is a, a set of tools that collect NetFlow streams, store it uh, for long-term analysis. That's the NFDump tool set. And NFSEN is a web interface on top of that that allows detailed data extraction. Um, so here are some screenshots. Again, don't try to read into the details, but um, some screenshots of NFSEN allowing you to see um, a great deal of information about the number of packets, the, the, the number of TCP connections, the number of ICMP connections. You can apply filters, so you can say, well, I, I only want to know about the web traffic. I only want to know about traffic entering the network, or traffic leaving the network, or traffic within the network. Um, so you can dynamically apply filters and profiles um, to allow you to look at that information. And then it also facilitates creating NF dump um, filter format commands so that you can extract the detailed information out. And it's, it's an extremely useful tool. OK, finally, on the, visibility, the network visibility side, we've got anomaly detection tools. Uh, now, again, these may be useful for your networks. They may um, be useful for, to different extents for different networks. But uh, ARP Watch and ARP Alert, their function is to uh, look at a network segment and make a, a relationship of the IP addresses and the MAC addresses that are on the network. And if something changes, send an alert. So, if you know that you've got a fixed or highly secure network, someone goes and plugs something into a, you know, a port and they get past the um, NAC system that's in place, we want an alert sent about that. Uh, PRADS, a passive real-time uh, asset detection system, again, that listens to network traffic. It builds a database of hosts and services, and, um, both in terms of what's being requested and what's being served. You can then query that at any time and um, use it to build an inventory. You can actually use that also to inform your configuration of Snort by telling Snort, my network looks like this. These are the servers that I have. These are the clients that I have. This is what you should be worried about. And lastly, PBNJ. I think it might stand for peanut butter and jelly. I'm not sure. Um, that is an active network detection system. So it uses Nmap um, to uh, inquire what's on the network, um, get that information back, it puts it into a database, and then at any time later on you can then rerun that and see what has changed on the network. So different techniques, different tools, they may be useful for you. So uh, we're now going on to some host-based visibility tools. I'm running short on time, so I'm going to have to go through. Um, first of all, I'm just going to go through some useful tools that might be useful to anyone running Linux systems, then look at host-based intrusion detection systems. Sorry I'm having to go at this pace. I just tried to put too much stuff into it. A useful tool is etc. Keeper, ETC Keeper. Um, just keeps your configuration on your Linux hosts in version control. It doesn't necessarily prevent people from changing it, but if someone is trying to change it, then it makes it more difficult for them to hide what they're doing. It makes it more difficult for you, in response, to analyze those changes and to make them visible. So I've um, shown a screenshot here of HGServe. I use Mercurial for... Con uh, configuration management of uh, etc. directories means I can fire up a web browser and look through with a web browser what's changed about my configuration. Okay, a top, um, another useful tool. People just say, "Oh, it's another top," but this one is very useful because it uh, periodically records the state of um, the host. So, you know, very often in an operations team, you'd have a request come in to say, "Well, something happened last night on our cluster," or it worse still, from the sales team, uh, you know, we noticed a funny you know, drop in sales. Can you tell us what happened at half past four in the morning? And very often, you would have to say, you just don't have that information. You, we can't tell you what was happening on your system at half past two because you haven't implemented any historical information about what the process list was and what was actually happening. ATOP is useful because, by default, it takes a 10-minute snapshot of what's going on. You can step through in time periods and say, oh, I see. You know, this process happened, it consumed this much memory, hmm, that looks a bit suspicious. Okay, Audit D, this is really the, the, the key tool that uh, people building secure systems really ought to be looking at using for host auditing. Um, it is, you know, widely used, but it's also often ignored. So um, you can create rules to say that any particular type of file should be audited access, deletion, rename, move, all the rest of it. Um, Works with the kernel module. You've got 
the system there, and then the um, end user tools that we would use for reporting are AU Report and AU Search. They will allow you to look back through your audit system and pull back reports. Uh, we've also got Audisp D, which is a dispatcher, so that you can integrate the audit system into other parts of your security system. So you can trigger alerts, you can make things appear on uh, analysis consoles based on real-time actions in the uh, audit system. Again, don't try and look at the small text on here, but Linus is a very useful script uh, tool. It's in active development, and it's a tool that uh, you can use to um, audit your systems for security. It will come back to you with hardening suggestions. Um, I think this is actually one to keep an eye on. I think it's a, a very useful tool, and you can use it just to see, you know, has anything changed since the last time I ran this, and what is my host actually doing? So that's Linus. Moving on, host-based intrusion detection systems. So there are many, um, and there are many different techniques that you can use, but uh, one of the key ones that's required of things like PCI DSS and GPG-13 is file integrity monitoring. You want to say, Tell me that nothing has changed about this set of files. So um, OSSEC is a, a multi-platform uh, distributed host-based intrusion detection system. So you've got a server, you've got OSSEC agents running on lots of different platforms and systems, um, collecting log files from various other things, checking log files for particular pattern matches. Um, and again, you can uh, create email logs or syslog alerts, and you can output the uh, alerts into a database for collation, inclusion, into anything else. OS6 is a very useful tool. Um, on the file integrity monitoring side, there's Samhain. I'm not quite sure how that's supposed to be pronounced. I think it's an Irish word. But um, that is, uh, can be a standalone file integrity monitor. So you can install it on a server, set up a database of files that say this is how they should be, and it will alert you of any changes. But you can also use it in a distributed mode. So if you've got a cluster, if you've got a you know, cloud-based system, you can uh, use Samhain in this uh, client-server model. You can use the Beltane web front end to administer any changes. So you know that a new version has been pushed out. We can use the web front end to check that everything is as it should be. You're expecting to see certain changes. You can commit certain changes. So that's the new state that it should be alert me if it changes again. Okay, Tripwire, this is a, quite an old tool now, but it's lightweight, it is still very useful. You do use that for file integrity monitoring, so you build a database of files, uh, checksums that should be. Uh, you place the database on read-only media or read-only network share, and again, it will alert you if anything changes about that. It's interesting because its own configuration policies databases are digitally signed, so it's difficult for an attacker to update that unless they have another passphrase. So just another sort of technique. Similarly, there are other tools for file integrity monitoring, AID, uh, FCheck, and Stealth. They all have their own um, key features, and they may be useful to you in certain environments when you're building a system. OK, now we move on to good log file management. Um, and I'm going to break it down into sort of syslog um, alerting and application log. Um, yeah, application logs. And I'm not going to talk much about application logs because that's really for application designers. I'll touch on it in, in certain things. But syslog in the SME space, a lot of servers, a lot of systems, they just don't centralize their logs. So, you know, I've been asked to look at household name, websites. Oh, something happened. Can you go and have a look? And you're expected in an operations team to go and log on to 20 servers and use grep and orc and all the rest of it and said, I'm oh, not said, to, um, you know, extract information about what happened, and the client or the people, the owners of the website, haven't thought that centralizing those logs is a good idea. So it seems basic, bread and butter stuff, but get your logs in one place. Uh, if you're looking after Windows systems or other systems, there are ways to get Windows event logs also into syslogs. Um, generally, we'll be using our syslog, syslog ng now, and we can use TCP or RELP to make sure that those connections are secure and reliable. If you want to get a message through, RELP allows a, a back channel to say, you know, I'm sending you a message, I've sent it, I've received it, thanks, thanks very much. Or I didn't receive it, I sent it back again. Um, also here, there's another technique that is quite new and is a requirement for GPG-13, that's the uh, GCHQ 
um, sort of good practice guide for protective monitoring systems, so a lot of public bodies are having to adhere to this at the moment, uh, is cryptographic log signing. So if you get your logs in one place, you've got a, a, a proof of custody. You, you know that it was sent by this machine. You know that it was received by this machine. This machine signs it. So it creates a, a signed file. If someone comes in and tries to modify that log file, you can use the RSG util or whatever else to verify that you know, the log file has changed or the log file has not changed. So that is a feature of new R syslog versions and is um, a useful tool and technique. Uh, so you've got all the syslog data in one place. Just find some way of analyzing it, searching it. You know, there are free and open source tools to do this. One example is Adiscon Log Analyzer. So it's the company who does a lot of the R syslog development. They've got a simple PHP-based web front end to syslog data. Um, and you can search it by host, by um, priority, by all sorts of fields. Just helps to um, you know, extract that information that you want. Loads of alternatives. And many of these systems, Elasticsearch, Greylog2, um, Elsa is another one that's interesting. They may already be useful, be used in your application uh, logging. A lot of people will say, right, we put our application logs in here for analysis. Um, there's no reason why you can't put syslog data in there as well. Uh, so all sorts of tools. I'm not trying to get you to use one. Um, on the application logging side, I will just make, mention a one thing, which is that uh, uh, the, a lot of clients, a lot of business owners think that because they've got Google Analytics running on their website, that's enough for them. They can see all this rich information about where people are coming from, what they're doing, what the spikes are, all the traffic. But actually, it, it, it is incomplete. And getting that message across to owners of websites and owners of web applications is quite important. So you really do need to be logging and analyzing the log files themselves because your distributed denial of service attack, you know, your anonymous user isn't going to be submitting their information to uh, Google Analytics. So you can have people thinking, well, you know, the website is uh, appearing normal on Google Analytics, but the web servers are absolutely falling over themselves. You know, what, what is going wrong? They don't see all of the 404, you know, all of the errors that don't get returned. They don't see all of the you know, distributed users who are not submitting that information to Google Analytics. Um, one tool that can help is PWIC, a uh, nice open source tool, and that has a log analytics mode. So you can feed in web server logs and you can get out the same kind of rich graphical information that Google Analytics gives you. And um, you, know, you can use this in conjunction with other systems. So briefly, moving on to active response. What can we get the systems to do um, on attack? Now, I mentioned that we can have snort in inline mode, where if it sees malicious traffic, it will drop it or reject it. Um, you can also use snort SAM as a plug-in module for um, uh, snort, which will um, enact changes on a firewall, one or more firewalls. So you have snort SAM agents running on the firewall machine or near the firewall machine, and it's got, it itself has plugins for lots of different firewalls. So if you see that you know, a particular host is sending malicious traffic, snort tells snort SAM to go and block that host on the firewall. You have to be careful when designing any kind of um, active response and intrusion protection system that it itself cannot be subverted. So if you've got you know, someone within a company and they're funneling out through a network address translation device, someone in a company wants to do something malicious, they can make it look as if the whole company is doing something malicious. You could inadvertently firewall away the whole company and cause a denial of service. So you need to be very careful with intrusion prevention systems, but um, they are useful. <clears throat> Secondly on here, fail to ban. Another great tool, um, sometimes overlooked, you can get it to scan through log files, again, regular expression pattern matching. Uh, when it sees certain things such as authentication failures um, in log files, it will modify the, the firewall rules to block that. And if you've got repeat offenders, they keep coming back, you can get it to monitor its own log files. So if the same offender gets blocked three times in 24 hours, block them for a year. Thank you. Um, OK, so we've got all these log files in one, in one place. We've got uh, intrusion prevention systems. Another way of getting the security information out of the combined log files is using um, a tool called Sagan, which uses like a snort-like pattern matching 
on log files, um, and then generating alerts and integrating with security information and event management systems. So here, I've just given an example which uh, will pick out from a log file the example of the wireless intrusion detection system that we saw earlier. So here's our broadcast disconnection and deauthentication flood message that's appeared on our syslog server. Sagan uh, can find that from the log file and can then um, make an alert about this on an intrusion detection system um, response. And also it itself can work with SnortSAM to modify firewalls based on log file matches. So a very flexible tool, uh, open source, under active development. So we're now moving on to some uh, sort of web consoles. If you're going to have something on a video monitor on the wall, what is a good thing to have to keep an eye, a top-down view on your network? Uh, one such tool is Snorby. Um, this is a nice uh, web-based tool, Ruby on Rails application, for collating intrusion detection system uh, alerts with uh, Sagan pattern matches. And you can see here that we've got the different severities of match, and that comes from uh, various rules that you define. From this interface, if you've got a network analyst console, you can integrate with OpenFPC for full packet capture. So we might want to be sitting at a central control room, and we might want to initiate full packet capture for a day or an hour, you know, some kind of capture on a remote interface. OpenFPC is one way of doing that. So there are other consoles available. Um, some of the improbably named Squeal and Squirt. Uh, Squeal is a, a client-server application and Squirt is a web interface to it. And Base is a um, slightly older web interface to Snort databases. So all very useful. Last couple of slides now. Um, OS SIM, uh, um, we're now moving on to focused distribution. So if you're not doing any network security monitoring or if you know that you've got um, you know, it's some way that you want to get started with it and it doesn't fit in with your existing uh, distribution uh, methods, uh, you can look at these uh, focus distributions. OS SIM by Alien Vault is a very interesting product and you see here it's got a list of many of the open source uh, components that we've mentioned here today. Um, be aware it is an open core product so they will try to upsell you to the USM product uh, for certain industries, certain environments that might be a good, good product, but be aware that you, you click on buttons and it says upgrade. Um, they have their own custom web framework, custom correlation engine, so it's a useful tool. The next one is the security onion, and I think this is uh, one of the most um, interesting projects in terms of a focus distribution. It is an Ubuntu-based distribution, and it pulls together a great number of the tools that we've spoken about today, and uh, allows you quickly and easily to build a distributed network security monitoring platform. Um, so it uses uh, ELSA, that I touched on briefly, which is an enterprise log search and archive system to uh, collate all of your syslog and application log data, and allow you to query that and incorporate that within intrusion detection system databases. We've got other tools. We haven't even spoken about Explico, Network Miner. Explico allows you to reconstruct files that you've seen in passing network traffic. So it can you know, fish out video files or you know, emails or instant message or all the rest of it. Uh, CatMe is the full packet capture uh, application suite um, that is used in the Security Onion. Argus is um, a tool that is used to uh, have more statistical information about the kind of network traffic. So it sort of sits alongside NetFlow like that. And you can see here it actually allows you to do very interesting things with other tools like uh, geo-mapping um, the network traffic. So you can see here a, an output to, to Google Earth. Just representative screenshots. So in summary, uh, when you're conducting defensive information warfare on systems, we need to make sure that we've got maximum network visibility. We need to make sure we've got maximum host visibility. Um, rigorous log file management. So get all the logs going where they should be going, um, get them scanned for what they should be, get the right rule and pattern matches, and then that, uh, with the tools, will allow rapid analysis and response. So you need to uh, make sure that people are able to respond to it. Okay, thanks very much. That's the end of the presentation. If anyone's got any questions? Uh, yeah. Distribution, I mean uh, security onion and uh, 
They, uh, they uh, both pack all the ideas. They uh, have suricata, they have uh, uh, snort, they have, it seems a bit overkill. You should pick one or the other. Uh, uh, which one would you, which, which one do you use? Do you mean which of the distributions would I choose no, no, or which, which intrusion detection system? Yeah. Uh, it really depends on the environment, uh, and I wouldn't necessarily say that only one is right. Uh, essentially, the Suricata and Snort are engines. The um, key thing that they're doing is pattern matches based on the rules. So the rule sets that you have, whether you have the VRT rules from Sourcefire, whether you're a subscriber to that, whether you have the emerging threats uh, rule set, whether you create your own custom rules, those will be used by whatever intrusion detection system engine you've got. Or whether you have bro scripts to uh, pick out the relevant data from the traffic, uh, that is the, the key thing. Um, in terms of the engine, which engine I would use for a particular task, it would depend on the performance requirements um, and you know, how many sniffing interfaces we use um, and what we want to do with those alerts, whether we're doing a unified to output, whether we're doing output to a, an SQL database. I, I don't know. Um, probably, you know, Siricata's native multi-threading would give it the edge over Snort in terms of um, out-of-the-box performance because you wouldn't need to set up the PF ring um, side of thing. But you may already be setting up the PF ring side of thing for NTOP. Um, so you can choose what, uh, whatever you wish, really. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sorry. Oh, I beg your pardon. There's sorry, a gentleman there. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's right. Generally, the, um, the technique when we're dealing with signing log messages is not to sign individual log messages because the signature will end up larger than the log message itself generally and the performance overhead of signing that. So um, log messages would be signed in a block uh, often and that's, that's the technique that's taken by um, the Alien Vault USM product and um, by the R syslog, I, I believe. They sign a block of log messages to say that logs received between this timestamp and this timestamp appear here in the log file, and we can tell that that block has been unchanged because its signature is shown here. So yes, they're, they're, that, that is certainly um, a, a key part of the log signing requirement. And to be honest, it's, it, within the open source tools that I've come across, it's quite a new um, component. So with the Alien Vault USM, when they're dealing with the, the logger and the, the sort of enterprise side, um, they will talk about large scale SAN storage and high speed disk access for the logs because they're expecting vast numbers of logs. And in fact, you know, you, if you get your firewall rules, you can send every single permit and deny from your firewall rules um, on your switches and things. So you can generate terabytes of logs. Um, so, yeah, that, that is um, something that you will need to assess in your environment. What is the you know, event per second rate that you're going to be dealing with of logs coming in and uh, other messages from the passive um, scanners and things? So, yeah, log signing and the performance overhead is worth considering at an early stage. Okay, and your question? That's right. So it would be really interesting to differentiate between legit packet monitoring and illicit packet monitoring. Yes, yes. Um, that is very interesting. A truly passive network capture system uh, will not be easy to detect. You know, it's, it's nigh on impossible to detect. So if you've got uh, a network interface or a, you know, a switch port which is not receiving packets, um, you know, that, that is very difficult to detect. And I, I, there was, it was mentioned on the screen, but I didn't really have time to mention it. 
um, switch mirror ports is one way, of, um, one way of doing it. The other way is network taps. A network tap is a device that can only listen from a network and cannot uh, modify it en route. You know, network taps of uh, 10 or 100 megabits are cheap and cheerful. When you get up to gigabit network taps, uh, they become expensive. And when you get up to what the NSA and GCHQ allegedly use, uh, when you're talking about fiber optic taps, you know, they are very expensive. But they are truly passive and impossible to detect. Uh, there are, I think there are some techniques. Um, I wouldn't be able to um, mention them off the top of my head for, you know, if you've got just TCP dump running on a network. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Okay. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Um, I think the, the thing to get in, in terms of the, the smaller environment and, and that uh, requirement of keeping the workload down, uh, it's about responsibility and making sure that it is someone's continual task to be in charge of that network monitoring. So yes, when you first put it in place, there might be a high volume of alert and you will need to tweak which rules are applicable to your system. Um, it's not a vast amount of work because you just sort of look at the, you know, the requirement. If you're coming from a low level, um, you say, okay, well, that, that's fine. But I know I haven't got any Windows systems in this network segment, so I can take all of these out. I can take all of these rules out. Um, it's, it's just about having that ongoing responsibility to say it's someone's. Because otherwise, someone will be given the task of installing a network intrusion detection system, and they'll be you know, fired the next week, or they'll be moved on to something else. And because there's a, an overload of log messages and security monitoring stuff, it will never get done. It will never get looked at. It doesn't become a key part of that organization's information security infrastructure. So it, it will vary very much on the environment, whether it's, you know, it could be a corporate LAN or it could be a cloud-based um, you know, system or it could be a, you know, some co-located service. Depending on the nature of the environment and the services that it will provide, because it, you know, a server has to provide some services, they will be attacked in some way. Um, that, that load can be one person's or it can be shared with a department. Uh, as long as the responsibility is there of someone or some function within the organization, that's the important part. Okay. Oh, yeah, finally. Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.